What did you expect to happen when you showed up here today? Something to think about. What did you expect to happen now, when you showed up here today, when you knew that from 10 to 11.30, this 90 minutes that we were going to have together as a church family, what did, what did you expect to happen when you rolled out of bed and jumped in the shower and started uh, doing your hair or, you know, whatever? What were you thinking about? That's mostly for the women, obviously. Um, so what, what were you thinking about in anticipation of 10 o'clock? What were you expecting to to see, to feel, to experience when you cross that threshold from the parking lot into, into our gathering place here? Is it something, maybe the question I'm asking you is something you've never thought about. And it's not something I just want you to think about today, but it's something I want you to continue always to think about is what am I expecting to happen? What am I expecting to take place when I show up? I used to uh, work for a church, this is many years ago, Gosh, forever ago, when Carrie and I were first married, I worked for a church, and uh, I remember being in staff meeting, and uh, the worship pastor at the time in this particular staff meeting was frustrated, and he was saying, uh, I'll, you know, I'll paraphrase, but he was saying, man, like, people just don't engage in worship. Like, in other words, the band's up there playing and, and doing their thing, and everybody's just standing there with blank stares, right? No response, no reaction. They could, it seems like they couldn't care less, that kind of stuff. And he said, uh, this concluding remark he said was, you know, uh, people just don't show up expecting anything anymore. This is many years ago. And my response to him right away uh, was, I see what you're saying. Do you think we give them a reason to expect anything? Do we give them a reason to have expectation uh, when they walk through the doors? Or is it just that they know, because we've trained them to understand that it's just going to be ho-hum. Grab some donuts, grab a coffee, come in, sing a few songs, hear a nice message, uh, and then walk out the door, go to, you know, Applebee's and go home, take a nap. Regular old Sunday, right? Have we given them a reason to think uh, that when they walk through those doors, something is going to be different? Or have we just said, well, it's just, you know, it's a standard. Nothing to see here. Just a regular old church service. But what I hope for us, what I hope for, for all of us collectively, is that we understand uh, that when we come together as a community, and we gather with however many people are in this room, 140 people that are in this room, and we worship the living God, and we lift praises to him, we proclaim his name, and we pray, and, and we listen that, you know what? He might actually show up. And guess what happens when he shows up? Things change, right? It's everything that Jordan was praying about. And that prayer, man, I was like about to pull a Kool-Aid man and run through the wall, you know? <laughs> like, I get, I get pumped up about that stuff. I was just ready to bust down a wall somewhere. I don't, there's nowhere to really do that that would be all right, but uh, that I could think of anyway. But that's, that's my personality, obviously, is I get pumped up. But it's like we pray those prayers, and Jordan's not praying that just for the heck of it, right? He's not praying that just so it sounds like, oh, this is a nice prayer, and that's cool or whatever. No, it's because we believe that, when, that there is a living God, right? And that he dwells in us, and that he dwells in us collectively, and that he inhabits the praises of his people, and his presence is fullness of joy, and that when he shows up, people are transformed, and relationships are restored, and uh, diseases are healed, and people become, you know, from unbelief to belief, from darkness to light. We believe that's possible, and we don't believe it's possible, eh, like every seventh Sunday or something like that, or, you know, every now and again when there's a particularly uh, good message or when we, we just happen to hit the right song, because if we think that, then it suddenly becomes about us, right? What we believe is that he shows up in power regardless of what we think the right format or mood or those things are. We don't depend on the right lighting, the right song, the right message. Now, those things should be good, but we don't depend upon that, right? And so my challenge to you would be, what are you expecting? What do you expect to happen when you show up? Because I came here this morning, and I've been a pastor for a very long time, and 18 years into it now, 19 years actually into it, I have no less sense of expectancy than I did when I started. No less. In fact, it's probably increased. I show up here knowing God wants to do something. 
The Holy Spirit wants to move in power. He's not interested in us just hanging out for a while. He wants transformation to take place more than all of us do combined. So we're going to get after it this morning. Sound good? Okay. So, like I said, give me a wall, run right through it. So, so we're in the middle right now. We're in this series, Jesus is Better, and we're in week nine of this. Uh, I've heard, and I know Pastor Jordan's heard too from many of you, uh, that you've just really been enjoying this series. You've been enjoying this sort of step-by-step walk through the book of Hebrews. And I know, obviously, that, you know, we've been taking a chapter a week, which isn't easy. So we've been pulling and, you know, extracting basically one theme uh, from each chapter that we feel like God is speaking to us to speak to you. And we've been really excited about it. It's been great. We're in week nine in this morning. And so, in other words, we're in chapter nine. And so chapter 9, if you've been following along and you've been seeing kind of the trajectory of this, chapter 9 lands right towards the end, basically, of this incredibly dense section. Now, a lot of Hebrews is actually dense. It's considered maybe the greatest theological treatise in the entire Bible, uh, right on par with Romans. And so a lot of it is dense, and it's written to uh, a bunch of Jewish people with Jewish custom and Jewish tradition and Jewish understanding and first century culture. So we we're trying to really uh, sort of explain all that and give context. And Jordan spent the last couple of weeks really doing that a lot uh, regarding some of those things. So this is an incredibly dense section in chapter 9 where the author's been walking us through a large portion of the background of the Jewish sacrificial system, right? How the sacrifice was to be offered, what that looked like, how it was to take place, uh, how the priest functioned, what his role was, all the things that he had to do. Uh, in order to make the sacrifice and the Day of Atonement and how that all worked and the Old Covenant. And Jordan talked a lot last week about the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. It's this incredibly dense, complex, uh, you know, portion of, of the book that you need to have a lot of background to interpret. And when you get that background, man, it's beautiful. It's powerful, incredible stuff. And you see this unbelievable link between, you know, thousands of years of history for the Jewish people and the way God set things up and then with Jesus coming and how he fulfills so much of this. And so this, this chapter, not this chapter, I'm sorry, this chunk sort of culminates, really, it comes to a head. It's like basically uh, the author sort of sums it up in one verse, in my opinion, uh, in chapter nine. That's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to take an interesting path here. This culminates in uh, chapter 9, verse 14. First, I'm going to read the NIV, and I think we'll have that on the screen. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more then, so remember he's gotten through all this stuff, sacrificial system, high priesthood, old covenant, all this stuff. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, Why? So that we may serve the living God. Let me read the message version because I absolutely love it. It, And this is, again, 914, the message. If that animal blood and all the other rituals of purification were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion and behavior, think how much more the blood of Jesus cleans up our whole lives, inside and out, Through the Spirit, Jesus offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from all those dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable. Why? So that we can live all out for God. So that we can live all out for God. Why did he do it? Really gives us the answer. Why did Jesus go through all that, become the perfect sacrifice, the perfect high priest? Why did he come down amongst us? So that we can live all out for God. So if I was going to sum this up, all that we've talked about so far comes to a head 914. What the author's saying is, Jesus is better, right? Things are handled. Things are handled. Now let's get on with it. Things are handled. Let's get on with it. So if it is true and we take this, right, at face value, we take the author at his or her word here. And we say, okay, it's handled. Jesus has become the once and for all perfect sacrifice. Those old systems, we're not adherent to those anymore. We're not subject to that. We're completely and totally set free. Our consciousness could be clean. All that sin's been washed away. And now, now we can live 
all out for God. If that's true, all right, that's very good news, isn't it? That we've been set free and we can live all out for God. All right, that's really a big chunk of the gospel, not just that we go to heaven when we die, as Jordan talked about, but that we can bring heaven here, that we can live and experience portions of heaven now. So this good news, if that's the case, are we? Are we living all out for God? How many people do you know that you would look at and point at and say, man, that's somebody that's living all out for God? Now, that might be a difficult question to answer. Because in some ways, it might be a bit subjective and hard to determine. And that's not what I want to focus on today, but something to think about. Because if you don't know a lot of people and you feel like yourself, you're not doing that, that you're not living all out for God in whatever that looks like exactly, there's probably a whole other sermon there. The question is, then, what is blocking us? If we're not living all out for God, what is blocking us? What is stopping us from doing that? You know, I used to coach uh, football, baseball, and basketball. I coached uh, varsity uh, football, varsity baseball, and then uh, and I was the head coach, and then uh, basketball just in uh, some summer leagues. Uh, oh, for four years, I did that. But I coached for quite a long time. And so as a coach, I have certain expectations that I set in place for the players on the team, and we're doing certain things, whether it's warm-ups or skill work, or drills, or whether we're doing some sort of a scrimmage or, or live, uh, you know, live tackling or whatever it is. I have certain expectations that I set, and the thing that I told the kids always, this was kind of my like thesis statement or motto for them. I said, I will never, ever get upset with you ever for a physical mistake when you're giving max effort. Never. Like, if you are absolutely, you know, busting it, in baseball, we'll say, and you go all out and you dive for a ball and it gets by you, I'm never going to yell at you for that. But if you loaf after one, right, oh, we're having a different conversation, right? But my concern wasn't necessarily as superficial as that. My question, or my concern, I should say, is if a kid is loafing after a ball instead of hustling after it, why? Why? Why are they not giving max effort? What is going on with them, right, up here that's causing it to play out physically? Where's the disconnect? Is it that they don't really like to be out that much and their parents made them? Is it there? And it could be a, a bunch of complex issues. It's not even something you need to blame them for, per se. It could be that they're distracted that day. It could be because they just broke up with their girlfriend. It could, it could be a lot of different things. Right, but I wanted to get to the heart of that. Right, and that's what I'm kind of asking here is like, not so much, well, I'm just not trying hard enough. Well, okay, I get that, but what is going on that's blocking us from living all out for God? You know, there are obviously a variety of factors, and there's probably a massive sermon series we could do on this. But today I want to address just one, and it's probably one that you haven't heard addressed as much as I believe it should be. So let me just, uh, or you haven't heard as much as you should have, maybe, is even a better way of saying it. So let me throw up kind of the, I'm going to give away a little bit of my ending up front, and then we'll kind of go through it. So this will be on the screen for you. When it comes to believers, and this is a Josh Goodman quote, okay? So if you disagree with it, you can talk to me. So when it comes to believers advancing the kingdom of God, sin is not my biggest concern, and it's not apathy either. You're like, wait a second, what? My biggest concern is that many people who truly love Jesus choose not to act due to a self-judgment that has convinced them that they aren't worthy, acceptable, and or good enough to be a factor in the battle. Might want to take a picture of that one or make a mental note of that one. If you're watching all online, a screenshot right now would be good. I'm telling you, Sin is not my biggest concern. Apathy is not my biggest concern. In a lot of cases, I think those are symptoms. A lot of times the illness is the self-judgment 
that's convinced us that we're not, we can't do it, right? Many of us, and this is my opinion, of 19 and a half years now of being a pastor, many of us, most of us, right, the lion's share, the majority of us, we genuinely love Jesus. We're not showing up here, excuse me, on a Sunday morning and coming to men's or women's Bible study and being in a life group, right, and, and volunteering in certain ministries and doing other things and studying our Bible. We're not doing all that because we're trying to miss it. We're not. We genuinely love Jesus. We genuinely want to to serve and be a part of the kingdom. Now, we may, again, have some issues that are holding us back. We may have some sin issues, but again, those are a symptom of something a lot of times that's going on. But the illness that many of us have that keeps us from really living all out for God in the fullness and the way that we should be, where we feel like we're coming alive, we have an inaccurate picture of who we are in Jesus. And that leads to all sorts of problems, including sin. We could have a whole discussion about, like, if you, you feel like you're struggling with a sin, well, why? And I can show you how it usually stems from a brokenness inside of you, an inaccurate picture of who you are. And so it plays itself out in those ways. But what it also leads to, this inaccurate picture of yourself, it might lead to some sin issues, but what it also leads to is fear and shame. Right? We're afraid to do anything because we don't think we measure up So follow me here. We're afraid to do anything because we don't think we measure up, and so we don't do anything, and then we feel ashamed of ourselves because we aren't doing anything. And it's this vicious cycle that we feel like we can never escape from. Now, the other side of that is that there are many people who feel ashamed or they don't measure up, and they actually try to do too much stuff, so they feel like they can be acceptable, and that's a whole other conversation. This morning, we're talking about people who are paralyzed and crippled by fear and shame and feelings of inadequacy and they don't measure up and they're not good enough and they don't have the right gifts. Another big statement here on the screen for you. We often, we often do the enemy's work for him. You know, the enemy is referred to by many different names uh, throughout the, the sweep of scripture. But one of them is he's called the accuser of the brethren. Right, the accuser of the brethren, and I'm telling you, a lot of times he doesn't even need to hang out around us because we already accuse ourselves almost in some ways way more than he'd ever think to do. I mean, we're our harshest critics, we beat ourselves up in ways that we would never do to anybody else. Maybe we're great at forgiving others for the things they've done, but we look at it, we are unable to forgive ourselves. So we live in this shame and condemnation and guilt and and fear. We often do the enemy's work for him. We become our own accuser. Let's shift gears just slightly here for a second. Most of you have probably heard of uh, what's known as identity theft. Maybe some of you have even been victim of it. Statistically speaking, there would be many people in this room who have been a victim of it. Identity theft is one of the fastest growing crimes right now in the world. The last time they did data for this was 2017. There were 16.7 million victims of identity theft in the United States. That's a new victim every two seconds, which is pretty crazy. Have you ever thought of the idea, and this is something maybe that's a little deep for this morning, but that a crime in the natural can actually reflect a crime in the spiritual. That what's happening, identity theft, practically speaking, when it comes to somebody taking your identity, your social security number, credit card stuff, actually might reflect something deeper that's happening too in our society, spiritually. I think there's been still, I would say, the fastest growing crime or the most heinous crime in the church today is identity theft. The people's identities have been and are being stolen all the time. That we've been told that we're just worthless sinners, that we're no good, that we'll never overcome, that we'll never measure up. That no matter what we do, we'll never be good enough. And the idea of this is it keeps us humble. And honestly, it's straight from the pits of hell. It doesn't keep us humble. 
It keeps us in places of shame and humiliation and inadequacy and broken down and crippled, and paralyzed and feeling like we can never do anything. And it keeps us sort of serving this God out of some really bizarre sense of like obligation, but we hate it and we hate ourselves, but we think hating ourselves is holy. And so we do more of it. See, we're not told the truth sometimes of what we should be told. It's not proclaimed often enough that, uh, yeah, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If you think Christ lives in you, that's kind of a big deal, right? If your identity is now that you no longer live, but Christ lives in you, that's, that's a big deal. And plus you have the Holy Spirit in you as well. And Paul writes to some of the worst churches in terms of how their behavior is in the New Testament. And he says, dear saints, dear saints of Corinth, dear saints, because he understands that their behavior doesn't establish where they are positionally. They may be acting a certain way, but that's not their identity, right? You can act stupid, right? That doesn't mean you are stupid. There's a big difference there. Our identity has been hijacked, right? So we, we focus so much on the negative, we forget that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. We've been crucified with Christ. We no longer live, but he lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit who wants to give us gifts and empower us and change us and transform us, right? And yeah, we can be a little rough around the edges, but there's a process of sanctification going on. There's a process going on whereby you're being uh, transformed and conformed to the image and likeness of Jesus. And if that's happening, why would we think that we're just so bad all the time? If there's a promise that says you are, when you're in Christ, you're being transformed and into the image and the likeness of Jesus, that's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty great thing. That should bring us joy and excitement. And oh man, look who I am now. I once was darkness, now I'm light, and now I have gifts and I can do these things. God, yeah, I'm rough around the edges, but God knows who I am. And there's this famous quote from Michelangelo where, where he carved this unbelievable angel out of marble, right? And they asked him, like, how did you do this? And he said, it was really simple. I just saw the angel inside the marble and I just carved until I set it free. Right? And that's what we're talking about. Is, yeah, you may feel like a big block of marble right now, but God's carving you and shaping you. He sees that inside of you, and it's important that we see that inside of us too. We have this identity theft, though, where the enemy has gotten inside the church, and we think it's a good thing to just constantly be focused on the negative, right? Instead of being empowered and equipped as saints and overcomers, we've been given a gospel of sin management. The cross is de-emphasized, and sin is overemphasized. You know, one of the verses we just read from Hebrews 9, 14. All that stuff's taken care of, now get on with it. Right? All the sin, all the shame, all those things that you carry, all that baggage, it's been wiped away, get on with it. Jesus is better, he's sufficient. We become entirely too sin conscious and not cross conscious enough. We focus too much on what we've done as opposed to what he's done. You know, I, I love uh, one of my heroes of the faith is a guy named Dan Moeller, and he said he, he's not a big fan at all, and, I, and you can debate this, but he's, he strongly dislikes accountability groups, right? He strongly dislikes those, and he's, his, his kind of catchphrase for that is, I don't care whether or not you're smoking. What I care is whether or not you're on fire, Right? Why would we hyper-focus on sin? Let's hyper-focus on the cross because there's this deep-seated truth here. This is a fact. And if you get nothing else from today, uh, this one line, just like, take it, do what you need to do with it. Tattoo it on you if you need to, okay? And it's this fact. We're not half as bad as God is good. We're not half as bad as God is good. Right? We no longer have to fear. We can have confidence in approaching God, confidence in our lives, and not just confidence, but boldness. We can have boldness. We don't have to be afraid anymore. 
No matter what we've done, where we've been, doesn't matter. You can come before the throne with confidence and boldness and ask things and understand who you are. And yeah, I know I've messed up and yeah, I still might be messing up. You know what? Jesus has that covered. It doesn't mean I'm not going to try that I'm going to keep sinning. That's not what I'm getting at. But what I'm focusing on is him and the cross and the Christ in me and the Holy Spirit in me. And I believe he's greater than these things. So I'm not worried about that. I'm going to keep moving. And if I make a mistake, I'll own up to it, but I'm going to keep moving, keep pursuing without shame, without fear, without guilt, because I know who I am and I know who he is. And so I'm not afraid, right? We can come with boldness, you know. If you look at the, the parable that Jesus told about the, the talents, it's a pretty famous one where a master gives each servant talents according to how he feels like, you know, they'll steward them. And he goes away and some of the servants take the talents and radically invest them. And they get massive return. And the one servant, right, he buries, he buries the talents. He does nothing with them. And his reason is that he was afraid. He was afraid. And that's the servant that Jesus is a little bit frustrated with, to put it mildly. We can't be afraid of what we have. We can't bury it out of fear or out of shame. You know, this stuff, this, this hiding out of fear and shame, it, it goes back to Adam and Eve in the garden, right? What was their reaction when they messed up, right? They had shame and they hid themselves. And so many of us were perpetuating that original sin all these years later. We're sin-focused instead of being cross-focused. And so we're ashamed and we hide ourselves. We bury our talents in the sand. Man, I just want you to remember, we're not half as bad as God is good. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, it does not matter. He wants you to get in the game. Another big statement here. If everyone in this room who is serious about Jesus left fear, guilt, shame behind and just started moving, just started going after something in the kingdom, we'd have to hire about five more pastors just to steward all the growth that's taking place. And I'm not talking about attendance growth. That might be a, a byproduct, and that would be amazing. But I'm talking about it, if we just started having people go after it, and they've had, you've had a dream in your mind of what you want to do for a ministry, you've had an idea of, of something that should be happening, that you want to head up, there's, you want to be trained in certain ways to do things, it would be impossible for us to manage it with the staff we currently have. It'd just be growth all over the place, but I'm convinced as I prayed about this, this is a big hindrance for so many of us. If we just left this behind and started moving, I would love to see what takes place. This time I want to invite a good friend of mine, Corey Chapman, to come forward. Come on up, man. And give him a little, a little welcome here. <laughs> Dude, you already have tissues. We haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> you t you sit you do whatever you need to do man you, tissues we can yeah that's all right yeah man have a seat make sure everybody can see you here so Corey and i have known each other uh for 27 years 27 years all the way back to Poor fresh guy. freshman year of high school so um and we i mean we've yeah a lot of stories i could tell um <laughs> No, I mean, in a good way, but I, but uh, why do I, anyway, <laughs> no, some good stuff, and, uh, and so, but a few, a couple weeks back, we had a men's uh, a get together, um, and, uh, and he and I had a chance to talk that night, just sort of, you know, call it coincidence or whatever, but it worked out, we talked for a long time, and we had, in my opinion, uh, and knowing him 27 years, we had the best conversation we've ever had in that 27 years, and I was incredibly blessed by it. Like, I just drove away, and I was just like, man. And I told Corey, like, some of the stuff you're telling me tonight, dude, people live their whole lives as Christians and never understand that stuff, and it's so unbelievably transformative. So when I put this together, I, I just felt strongly like I need to have Corey share. Like, I need to have him come up and just repeat this stuff because it's better than I could say it. And it's enfleshed in him, which is huge. And so it uh, so directly relates to what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to ask him a couple questions. First, just tell us a little bit about what you do uh, for a living, what you do for your job. 
Um, I have a small window cleaning company, so if you're taking notes today, it's Chapman Window Cleaning. <laughs> um, actually, uh, yeah, all right. we don't have a slide for it. We should have a slide for you it. You know, just, <laughs> just looking back, I can see God's hand in just everything along the way. Um, I started a new construction cleaning business, and the guy that washed the windows for me, a um, guy, Nate Swanson, um, he would invite me to go to work with him when my work would slow down, and um, it was just amazing. He is just an amazing man of God, and um, God brought him into my life, and he's been discipling me for four years, and he's seen, um, like a few of you have in here, some pretty ugly days out of me, and he just kept hanging in there, and it's uh, it just one of the most godly men I've ever met in my life, and uh, um, it's just been a blessing for our family, the window cleaning has, and, and he's been a blessing, and so that's, yeah. I wash windows. <laughs> so tell us, tell us just a little bit, I mean, a little bit, so you, basically it's kind of you, it's your business, and it's just you, you're the only employee right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so you're kind of by yourself all day, so tell me what a typical day kind of looks like for you. Um, usually I get up about seven, fill up my buckets of water. Um, I, this is the busiest I've ever been. My business has doubled already this year. Um, so my devotional time's been lacking a little bit. Um, I've been working a lot of days, sun up to sundown. Um, but Jesus is the first thing I think about when I wake up, and he's the last thing I think about before yeah. I go to bed. Um, I, uh, throughout the day, I don't, I don't do these things because I think I should. I do them because I enjoy it. I have five different podcasts I listen to. I listen to Bethel Church. Um, I listen to Stephen Furtick, Craig Rochelle, um, Bridgetown, uh, Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. And then I have um, everything from Bethel um, and Hillsong in my phone. So pretty much all day long, I get the opportunity just to worship Jesus, either through music or through um, listening through podcasts or just praying throughout the day. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just amazing. Um, that's pretty yeah, much. Yeah, and tell me kind of, you, you talked a little bit about, too, like, not just your approach in terms of listening to, to worship all day and podcasts and just saturating yourself, you know, with those things, those truths, but also sort of your approach to, like, when you're going to encounter a person or you know you're going to encounter a person in your business. Yeah, I mean, you, my, you, you get in the truck and you're saying, God, you know, um, I always say, because window washing, you pretty much have to be perfect at it. I mean, the window has to be perfectly clear. I'm like, Lord, with my hands be your hands today. Would my feet be your feet today? You know, um, bless this work, bless this house, and, and open doors of opportunity for me to share the love of Christ. And um, so every job I head into, I'm just like, come on, Lord, what do you got? What do you got here? What do you got here? Because, you know, it's just, it, it, it really, I mean, I, things have to look really good, but it's not rocket science washing windows either. You know, like, I'm just, it's pretty second nature for me at this point. So I'm like, okay, we got this covered. What what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do in this situation? And um, man, I tell you what, sometimes you just have to drop what your plans were. You know, all of a sudden you'll, you'll get this little old lady who's um, lost. I was doing a house not too long ago and she lost her husband a month before. And this should have been like a half hour job in and out. And two hours later, we're sitting there talking, you know, and I totally squashed my schedule. But sometimes you just have to trade out the money for what God's got planned for you. You know, yeah, that's a good word right there. That's powerful, man. You know, and um, we talked about this a little bit in advance. We're not going to go into any, into any detail on these things this morning, but I think you'd agree it's fair to say that maybe you've made some uh, decisions in the past that, that some people might uh, incorrectly, in my opinion, say would disqualify you from having any sort of ministry at all or ministering to people. Um, and could also lead you, I mean, uh, lead you in big ways to believe that you're disqualified. Yeah. Like, who am I? But that's not where you're at. I mean, dude, you're, you're not there, and that's what our conversation was about. So tell us, tell everybody here, I mean, what has Jesus done in you that you feel, uh, and I mean this in the best possible sense, but that you feel that you have the right uh, to tell others about him, uh, and that you're so bold about it? This is the more emotional part. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm overqualified. <laughs> um, you know, it's, you know, to... Um, I guess I'll just start here. About 10 years ago, I, I struggled with depression for 25 years. Um, I, I had this fear of impending doom my entire life. I was just sure I was never going to make it. I knew I was going to be a failure. 
And about 10 years ago, um, I read this book. A guy gave me a book by Stephen Furtick called Greater. And it talks about how God has just great plans for your life. And I just, I thought, but me? You have great plans for me, you know? And just a little bit, my heart jumped a little bit. I started to believe that maybe God had a plan for my life, you know? And, uh, um, but then the worries of the world and all that, it just, it, I just couldn't, I couldn't fully wrap my head around it. And, you know, Pastor Lori has like tried to beat this into my head for 10 years too, you know, that you find your identity in Christ. She'd give me like this whole list of scriptures, you know? Um, <laughs> It, this is your identity in Jesus, you know, and but it just the heart and the mind didn't connect. And um, so, you know, this last year, um, January 10th, I was set free from depression. I no longer struggle with depression. 25 years of deep depression. Um, <laughs> Jesus totally freed me from that. And, um, you know, Jesus came and he um, and he was the perfect sacrifice for us. And he rose from the dead. But we can't forget the fact that before that, he, he walked perfectly. He lived a perfect life. And, and that frees me up to remember that Jesus walked perfectly, so I don't have to. Not only is he the perfect sacrifice, but he did. He, he was perfect in every way while he was here. And that frees me up to realize that I can make mistakes. I'm going to screw up. And, um, you know, the bottom line is, is just is, is that my heart is focused on him, that I want him more than anything. And it's, it's, it takes the burden of life away. You know, it's, it's just a relational thing. It's, I don't have to measure up. I don't, you know, I used to be like, I'm going to read an Old Testament chapter, New Testament chapter, a Psalms and a Proverbs, you know. And I'm going to, you know, I was white knuckling it for, you know, to earn God's approval. And when, when you just say, you know what, Jesus, you did it all. I don't, I don't have to do it you know, and then, and then it becomes a joy, you know, getting in God's word becomes a joy, Spe you know, having a relationship with Jesus becomes a joy, it's no longer, I don't have to do the work, I don't have to do the heavy lifting, you know, uh, so. Yeah, that's amazing, man, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I, go ahead, no, go ahead. I did want to share, you know, um, a lot of times, like, my relationship with Jesus, like, sometimes I just, it's not really, I don't really want it, you know, and then I feel bad about that, it's like, I'm, I'm more focused on what I want, you know, and, and so I just say, Jesus, you know, I know that's not, I'm not, that's not who you made me to be, um, whatever that's, whatever is not of you and me, make it right, you know, bring me close to you, whatever of me that doesn't want you, burn it out, and, you know, like when Chrissy and I first dated, she didn't feel this way as much as I did. But, like, I don't know, like, you know, when, when you first started dating, you know, we were texting a lot and I had butterflies in my stomach and I was all giddy about her, you know. And, and a lot of times it's that way to date with us. But, like, to me, like, if your relationship with Jesus isn't like that, if you don't get butterflies um, in your stomach with your relationship with Jesus, ask him. T say, do that to me. Make, make me that way, you know? Um, yeah, that's a good word, man. That's a good word. So, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, in some ways you lived in that. You told me, too, you know, you lived for so long, uh, even though you wanted a relationship with Christ and had one, but you still lived in this constant, uh, you were sin-focused. I can't mess up. I can't mess yeah. up. I can't mess yeah. up. And then when you did mess up, it was, like, off the deep end, right? Yeah. Because, well, I've screwed up. And so, you know, like, well, forget it or whatever. But now, and it makes sure I'm saying this right, but basically now... There's, you're much more cross conscious, right? Where you're, yep. Like you said, he's lived, yep. he, he lived the perfect life, so I don't have to. Yep. He's done it. Now I just need to, to begin to live into that. Totally free. Totally yeah. free. Um, I remember when I, when I was, um, first started coming to New Point, um, I couldn't, my, my issue for 25 years has been drinking, and, um, and I, I couldn't get sober. Sunday after Sunday, I kept coming to church, and I said, God, I just want to go to a different church. I want to go to a big church where I can hide out and blend in, where people don't know me. They don't know my problems. And I knew every Sunday I'd come to church, I knew this is where God had called me. I knew I couldn't get what I was getting here anywhere else. And Sunday after Sunday, I'm like, man, I just don't. You know, this is the Sunday that they're going to tell me 
you can't come back here anymore. I was just sure of it. Every Sunday I came to church, and Pastor Black said to me, I came in one Sunday morning, he said, hey, I just want you to know you're always welcome here. And I was sure that was the morning. He, you know, I thought as he was approaching me, he was going to be like, you're too much of a sinner. You got to go, you know. And he, <laughs> and, and he just said, hey, you're always welcome here. And it was just a whole, totally Holy Spirit thing. And I just kept coming back, you know. I mean, props to you for all that, dude. <laughs> just for continuing to show up through all that and being rough. faithful. I, I don't doubt it, man. Rough. But it's just been amazing to see the transformation in you and those who have walked beside you. Uh, closely through this. I know I've seen it in huge ways, and I'm just personally, man, I'm excited for what God has for you, what he has to come in, so to restore all the stuff that's been broken, and yeah, thanks, man. You can go. Love you, brother. Take those. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, powerful stuff, and you, I know Corey would love to talk with any of you more about his journey afterwards, and uh, or whenever, really. He'll be here, obviously. So, um, but it is one of the things he said that's so important is you know white knuckling it versus um, just letting God do it and being okay with where you're at. Just saying, here's where I am. I know you know me. I know you love me. I know you want me to live for you. I want to live for you. I have these things that fear and shame and these things that are keeping me down. Take them away. Let's go. Let's do it. So the question is then how, right? So let me just kind of close with these things. Um, we're actually going to skip the, the stages uh, slide, guys, and move on to, to another one. Yeah, the band is coming up at this time. So what do, where do you go from here? If you're sitting there this morning like, oh, my gosh, I'm so, you know, trapped in this, this cycle of, of shame and fear and guilt and condemnation, and I can't get out of it. I don't feel like I'm good enough. All right, if you knew what I've done, all right, you, I, it's different for me. All right, what do, you, what do you do? What do I do? Let me walk you through a couple practical, super practical things. The first one is the one that I almost always use, but it's just begin to pray. You begin to pray, and pray specifically this prayer. Pray, God, just show me more of who I am in you. I don't care if you sit there and just repeat that one line endlessly. If that's the only prayer you pray until you start to be transformed, I'm cool with that. Don't worry about anything else. I'm not kidding. Don't worry about anything else. We're praying anything else. Just whenever you think to pray day after day, God, show me more of who I am in you. Show me more of who I am in you. And there are other things that probably will come up, but just start there. Show me more of who I am in you. I don't want to be bound by these things anymore. Reveal to me who you've created me to be. The second one's also very practical, which is begin then, as that happens too, when you see who you are, begin to work work some things out. Do you recognize that this is who you are, but something is holding you back in a little way? Work it out. Talk to your friends, those that you trust, your pastors that know you well, anybody that knows you well, and say, where do you see me bound up? Do you see, do you see things in me where I'm where I'm paralyzed, where I seem like I'm crippled, where I can't move forward. What are those things? And trust yourself to those people. That may be terrifying, but it's gonna be revelatory. And then once you, once you find out like, man, okay, I see that. Let's start to work on that. Do what you need to do, pray into that. If you need to go to counseling, go to counseling for it. There's no shame in that. Don't be stubborn. God, show me more of who I am. Friends, pastors, people around me that know me. Where am I struggling? Where can I, where do I need breakthrough? Show me more of that. And as you're doing that, as you're praying, and as you're working on it and working it out and and working through things with the power of the Holy Spirit, not just white knuckling it, but very in a peaceful way. The third thing is get a move on. Okay, get a move on. What I mean by this is start to do something. Embrace that fear. If you feel inadequate about whatever it is, sharing Jesus with somebody, share Jesus with somebody. It may seem like a gigantic mountain to climb, so start as slowly as you need to. I don't know what that looks like for you, right? But do something. Start to move forward. Go directly into that. Take up that talent you've buried and say, God, what do you want to do with this? Let me, show me. How do you want me to move? Start doing something. No matter how small, 
or in your mind, insignificant, it seems, start to move. That will create momentum, I promise. Now maybe don't come up and say, I'm praying about this and working it out and I wanna get a move on, so can I preach on a Sunday morning? Maybe don't start there. But something, right? So this pray, work it out, get a move on. And then step four is just rinse and repeat, right? Just keep going on this. Just rinse and repeat, keep moving, keep praying, keep seeking it out, all with his power, not through your own strength, but through his. Man, the band's gonna close us off here, the worship team's gonna close us off here in just a minute. One thing I'd like to do uh, this morning, and I honestly don't know how it's gonna work logistically, so we're just gonna do our best. Uh, but as the band's playing, I'd love to have it if, uh, Corey, if you and I can be over here in this little triangle cutout place. Jordan and Lori, if you wouldn't mind being over in this like triangle cutout place. And if, you, if there's anybody here this morning that you're like, man, I, I just struggle so much with what you're talking about. I've been so paralyzed by shame. I don't know who I am. I feel like I'm worthless. I feel like all these things. Would you come during, while the band's playing and let us pray for you? I know that may be a big step be that vulnerable, but I just at least want to open that up. I don't, I don't want to, uh, to just leave here without giving you the opportunity to do that. So Corey and I will be over here to pray over you. That there'll be supernatural healing of that. The things will just break off of you. That you'll leave here just uplifted and a thousand pounds lighter in your spirit. Jordan and Lori will be over here praying the exact same stuff. And it gets back to that initial thing I talked about. What are your expectations for this morning? Because I believe you came here maybe buried underneath this junk and you can leave here free from it. I really do. So let me pray. Worship team will begin to play and then we'll be op opportunities to pray. Just come down if you'd be so bold. Jesus, I pray for anybody right now in this room who's been bound up in these lies, buried under the weight of this guilt. It's become their own worst accuser. I pray that right now, Holy Spirit, you would touch them in such a way that they literally float up here for prayer. Like that they, they don't even know how they're moving or why they're moving, but they're coming anyway. I pray that you would stir up hearts that you would transform minds this morning, that you would break chains. As we sang earlier, there's power in the name to break every chain. We believe that. But as we pray for people this morning, just touch them with your power, Holy Spirit, in whatever ways they need to be touched, you know. Jesus, we just give the rest of this time to you as we have the, the previous part. Just fill us up. Thank you.